Dwarf Fortress. If you clicked on this video, I'm presuming it's not because you wanted me to tell you why you should play Dwarf Fortress or why it's fun. It's because you've already decided that you want to play it and you want to learn. Now this is a really complex game and there's an enormous amount to learn. If you want to be able to just start having fun quickly, that's completely possible to do. And this video is meant to give you all the tools you need to start playing comfortably. I'm going to presume from the very beginning that you have no idea what you're doing and you don't even have it downloaded. And then by the end of this video, you should know how to make a fortress that is decently survivable so that you can start exploring the game from there. Now first you're going to want to download the Lazy Noob Pack, strongly recommended for beginners. I'll provide a link in the description of the video, but you can also just Google a Lazy Noob Pack Door Fortress, you know, something like that. So download this thing. So once you got it downloaded, right click on the starter pack and extract it. Uh, I think everyone has extraction stuff just automatically on their computers these, these days. Don't, oh, I guess I'm using WinRAR. I don't know if that comes with Windows. We'll get WinRAR if you don't got it to extract if you need it. Then when it's extracted, just click on the starter pack launcher. So I'm gonna go through some options that you should set at the very beginning. I'm not going to cover too much why you should select those options because I'm trying to make this tutorial quick. You just gotta trust me, man. Set in tomb pets to no, set aquifers to no, set starting labors to no. Go to the graphics tab, take your pick of graphics. You can look them up and see what they look like. I'm just gonna go with Phoebus, which is the default for the lazy noob pack. I think it's really good for learning to play the game. All right, and so these are utilities. If you right click on them, they will start automatically when you run the game. And you should make it so that Dwarf Therapist starts whenever you run the game. I consider Dwarf Therapist the most important utility for Dwarf Fortress and it is especially useful when you're learning how to play. Now, I'm going to turn the sound off, but if you haven't heard of the nice songs that Toady has composed, you should listen to them, because they are very good. I've just heard them literally thousands of times. Same goes for the intro movie. If you haven't watched it, you should. It's nice, it's cute. Set autosave to seasonal, just in case there's a game crash. They do occasionally happen. Don't be too stressed out about it, but as long as you have your autosave on seasonal, it's not gonna be as detrimental. Consider setting initial save onto yes for the same reason. And I'd keep these on for your first game, but if you figure out kind of how this works, you might want to end up turning these off. Set processor priority to whatever you want. I've never noticed any difference. And then play Dwarf Fortress. Dwarf Therapist is going to open up. Just press this close button and just leave it open. Remember that it's there, you know, you're, you're going to come back to it later. Uh, this is the DF hack window. Ignore it for now, but I'll show you something you can do with it later. Let's get to the game window. I would maximize it if I were you. Press enter to create a new world. For your first world, I'm going to recommend small, short, very high number of civilizations, very high number of sites, uh, really high number of beasts, because beasts are cool. Yeah, sure, turn the savagery up too. It'll be more fun. And get minerals everywhere. And press Y to generate your world. You'll see roads developing and tunnels. You see these little dwarven civilizations. The yellows are elven civilizations. Purple are goblin. Oh, here's a necromancer tower right here. These AE symbols, these are human civilizations. There's a lot of goblins on this island over here. Holy crap. And at 125 years, if you pick my settings, then it, it'll be done generating. And you can press enter to accept the map and then you'll be able to play on this map. So once you have your map generated, press enter to start playing, enter to play Dwarf Fortress, and then you're going to pick an embark location. Now, if you press the arrow keys, it's going to move your little cursor around the map. You'll see in the upper left, that's the local map, and that's showing you what is like literally around your embark. If you look at that little black square, which you can move with U, M, K, and H, this is going to be basically the map that you're going to be looking at while you play the game. This is where, you're going to, where your fortress is going to be. Say so if I was to decide to embark here, you look on the right and it's going to have the information on that little black square right here. So if I was to embark here, there would be a, it would be temperate savanna. So there'd probably be a few little trees kind of there and there, but mostly a grassland. There'd be a little brook running through the lower half of my embark. It's untamed wild, so I'd probably run into some pretty nasty wild animals. Would be a lot of fun. And you'll see here that there's sand, clay, lots of soil, metals both shallow in the earth and deep in the earth, and a flexstone layer, which is important for steel making. This actually wouldn't be too bad of an embark. What I'm going to show you is how to use the find tool. So you press F, 
You can use the arrow keys to go up and down and you can actually choose the parameters for the type of place you want to embark. If you press left and right, it's going to change the values. Press left to switch Fluxstone layer to yes. Press right to set aquifer to no. Press left to set river to yes. Press left to set shallow metals to multiple. Left to set deep metals to multiple. And you can decide whether or not you want clay. When you're done setting your parameters, press enter and it's going to search through the entire map starting in the upper left corner and kind of going down and it's going to look for all of the spots that fit these parameters. Since you have aquifers turned off, there's probably gonna be a lot of spots. And as you can see, this is most of the map. So after you're done searching, press escape to browse the results. And then you can move your cursor through all of this green bullshit and find a place to embark. Having this find tool is just kind of a security measure so that you don't embark somewhere that's really hard to live. I'm going to turn it off right now because it's hurting my eyes. Now something else you're going to keep want to keep in mind when choosing an embark location is your neighbors. If you press tab, it's going to show you where your neighbors are and if you move around you'll see that this will change. Uh, it looks like there's actually a pretty good spread of neighbors at least on the mainland. Down here there's a necromancer tower. If you look on the left regional map you'll see right here there's necromancer tower. I strongly recommend that you do not start out next to a necromancer tower while you are learning the game. It's going to hurt. But pretty much anywhere on at least this map is going to have all four of your neighbors. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for dwarves, elves, goblins, and humans. That's going to make your game as interesting as possible. If you press tab again, it's going to show you a list of civilizations. And if you press the plus and minus keys, it's going to move between them. And you can see on the world map, the different spreads of these dwarven civilizations. This is basically going to be your parent civilization. So for now, just pick one that you think has the coolest names. I'm going to go with the Fed Tombs. You press tab again, and this is just going to show the elevation on your local map. This is a good way to find cliffs if you're interested in trying to find a cliff, as well as the cliff indicator, which, do, which does the same exact thing. If you look here, there's some pretty steep elevation, uh, particularly right here. Oh, well, there's a fortress built on it. Here's a good example right here. If I was to embark here, it would be a completely flat embark. There wouldn't be any hill whatsoever. Now you'll notice on the local map that it looks a little different in the upper left corner than it does from the rest of the map. That's because there's more than one biome here. If you want to see the information on the upper right on these different biomes, right now it's showing temperate shrubland, which is in the upper left. You press the F1 and F2 keys, and it's going to show you the information on the right about these biomes. You'll see that this temperate shrubland over here has a flux stone layer, but this temperate freshwater marsh down here does not have a flux stone layer. So what that does mean is that if you were to embark here, you would have different terrain on the surface. So there'd be different kinds of plants and different kinds of animals coming in too. And below ground, you'd have different geology. I'm going to embark on this nice little forested stream near the Arctic Ocean to erect a new frontier for my parents' civilization. Just make sure that before you embark, double check, make sure you've got all four kinds of neighbors and no towers, and make sure that you've at least got trees, vegetation. You might not want to start out somewhere that's evil, but un untamed wilds or wilderness is fine. Make sure you've got shallow and deep metals and a flux stone layer. And when you're ready to go, press E to embark. Now you could just press play now, but that's gonna make it harder for you, funnily enough. So what you're going to want to do is press down and press enter to prepare for the journey carefully. Now this might seem like an intimidating screen. You don't gotta understand everything that's going on yet. Just understand that when you press up and down on these, these are your dwarves that you're starting out with. It's seven dwarves, some Snow White shit. If you press V, you can read up on how the dwarf looks on some of its personal characteristics, say, you know, its strengths and weaknesses, on its preferences. You can see what her dream is. She wants to raise a family. See these little kind of personality quirks that she has. All of these things actually will influence the way that she acts in the game. So you can view through those and give your dwarves labors that kind of fit them. But if you're just wanting to be quick and jump in, basically just do what I do and I'll explain why I'm making these decisions as the game goes along. So to give your dwarf a skill and a labor, you're going to want to press right. Then you press the plus and minus keys to put points into those skills. Now you can give up to 10 
skill levels to a dwarf, but keep in mind that these are going to cost embark points and you're going to need these for the items that you're embarking with as well. Though you'll be comfortable using as many of these as you want because if you press tab you'll see that you already have a bunch of points invested into items anyway that you can switch up. You press tab again to get back to this space. So from your dwarf page, you press right, press plus to make one a proficient miner, then go to the next one, make it a proficient miner, then go to the next one, and you're gonna want this one to be a proficient woodcutter, as well as a proficient herbalist, which is down here. You press left, go back, press right, and you're gonna want a proficient carpenter. Then you're going to want a proficient mason, and building designer on the same dwarf. You're going to want a proficient stone crafter and a proficient mechanic. Now there's a lot of different embark strategies you can use. I'm just recommending this one because it's really good for beginners. Now go back to your miners real quick and press right. And then if you hold up and go up above miner, this is gonna bring you to the bottom of the list. And there's a couple things that you should give one of your miners. And that is appraisal and judge of intent. This is just because at least until you get a better broker, you're going to have a dwarf that can see how much stuff costs in trade and can kind of read the mood from who he's trading with. So now you're gonna press tab to go to your items. Uh, just wipe just hold down the minus key and it's going to wipe all this stuff out and I'll show you kind of what you should bring just from the beginning to add an item you press new and there's a lot here you could you know use the arrow keys to scroll through this and press enter to choose things but there's a way to make it faster you press n and then you just start typing what you're looking for so first type copper and copper picks will show up right away because it's at the top of the list you're going to want two copper picks press n again and type iron anvil and grab one iron anvil and again and copper battle axe this is going to be your wood cutting axe for your wood cutting dwarf so and again and type in dwarven and you'll see you've got wine ale beer and rum if you press plus and minus this is going to increase the amounts of these this is a really good thing to put a lot of your points into while you're learning because it gives you food security. And I'm going to recommend taking about one to 200 specific units of alcohol. Now you can make them all the same kind of alcohol if you want, say if you really like rum, but your dwarves do have different preferences and the more different kinds of alcohol you have, the more likely they're going to find one that they like and that's gonna make them happier and your dwarves being happier is important. Now you're gonna to wanna to bring some food. You have a ton of options for food, but you should bring things that cost two points. You could start your dwarves out on porcupine lungs if you want or ant brains, but I'm gonna be nice and start them on some cave fish, some giant sparrow eggs, and grapes and some pond grabber meat. And I'm gonna bump these up a little bit. Basically the ratio you're looking from when it comes to drinks versus food is about five to two. You're gonna want about five units of drink for every two units of food. So because I'm bringing 200 units of alcohol, I'm going to have 80 units of food. Next, bring a few goblets. Make sure you get some 10 point goblets, nothing too expensive. I'm going to go with snail shell goblets. Just bring a few, you don't need that many. It's just to keep your dwarves from drinking with their hands, which pisses them off. Just bring a couple of buckets. This is to deliver water in case of an emergency. Bring a bit of thread, which is to suture wounds in case of an emergency. Bring a bit of cloth for the same reason. This is all medical equipment, basically. If you press right, you can select animals to bring along with you. Uh, if you're a dog person, go ahead and bring some dogs. If, if you're a cat person, bring some cats. Even if you're not a cat person, bring some cats because what cats are going to do is kill vermin on your stockpiles. And if you don't have cats, you might be looking at soiled food. Now, something to keep in mind is that if you bring, say, male and female cats, they're gonna start breeding. Same goes for dogs and any other kind of animal. So if you wanna start breeding animals, that's something you can do. Just keep in mind that, especially with dogs and cats, which you might not want to butcher, depending on your feelings towards the animal, you might end up with a large amount of these things on your fortress. So I'm gonna go back to items, and as you can see at the bottom, that there's 244 points left. Now you can use, you can just have fun with these. Do bring, bring along whatever you want. A few things that you might consider are bags, which can help with storage kind of early on. I'm gonna bring about 10 of them personally. Uh, splints and crutches are something to consider for an emergency, but your carpenter will be able to build these. 
uh, rope is actually a very strong consideration to bring because this allows you to tie up guard animals or at least just warning animals that will let you know if something is trying to enter your fortress, oftentimes by being a sacrificial victim. A little bit of gypsum plaster might not be a bad thing to bring along, just in case you need to make casts during an emergency. What some people do is they bring along some bituminous coal to jumpstart their smithing industry at some point, and I'm going to bring along some petrified wood because I like its nice color. If you wanted to, you could name your fort by pressing capital F, you could name your group by pressing capital G, and you can set your symbol by pressing Y. When you're done with all of this, press E to embark. You're going to get this cute little message about embarking, ugh, cougars. And when you press enter, you are now going to be in game. You should pause it immediately by pressing the space bar so you can kind of assess your situation. Now the arrow keys are going to move you around your map. You can see here that I've got, this is the embark wagon right here, and it's got everything that I brought along inside of it. You can see my dwarves kind of chilling around the wagon. Uh, these yaks are what pulled the wagon in. Uh, I've got a cow and a bull. I could breed them if I wanted to. You can see my cat running around here and another cat. This here is the stream that I started on. The seven just refers to its depth. To say if I was to start draining it out, you'd see a lot of like sixes, fives, and ones, and twos, and whatnot, and that's just how much water is in that little square. See over here, there's some nice river otters chilling out in the stream. Um, there's ugh, sponge men. They're fucking nasty. There's a giant sponge right here. These little brown circles you're seeing, these are basically trees. They're tree trunks. And there's all these little saplings growing around here, all these little plants. You can see some kind of stone and soil poking up through the grass, little boulders chilling. And if you look over here at this kind of wall, you'll see soil wall. This, what this means is that this is basically a hill. And I'm kind of looking at the hill from this level at its side. Now, if you want to go up and down Z levels, you are going to press the left and right HTML brackets. It's like pressing shift period and shift comma. And it's going, and if you press this, it's going to go up and down. So, see, this is like below, right here, this is like below ground. And this goes down a ways, this is Dwarf Fortress, you dig. So you see, this is like at kind of the stream level, and this is right above the stream. And then as I go up and down, you'll see the hill kind of slope upward, and you also see the tops of the trees. Some of these trees are pretty tall. Now this is a little hard for you to wrap your head around. There's a tool that you can use to help kind of understand what you're seeing. If you open up this DF hack window and type in stone sense, it's going to show you an isometric view of your map and you can actually control it just like in the game. So you can scroll up and down and you can see that there are these trees. You can kind of more easily see how these, how this map is three dimensional, how these trees rise up and how this hill slopes up. If you hold control and roll up the scroll wheel, it's going to increase the number of Z levels you can see at once, which when you now scroll upward might kind of help you see more how this map is three dimensional in nature. Some basic controls for you, if you press tab a couple times, you can get rid of that map on the right, but you still might want to keep the control hotkeys up because it's going to help you. If you press K, you can look at things specifically, like you can see that this is a pine sapling right here. This is a, a the trunk of a plum tree. You know, if we go up, this is this whole thing is a plum tree. You know, there's some whip vines growing here. These can be gathered. There's also how you can go and check out these sponge men and see what's going on with them. Press enter and you can view them and say, uh, if you go over here, you can see that I've got silty clay and fire clay. Fire clay is actually really nice for a ceramics industry. And then down here, there's some exposed rock, which looks like rock salt. So I guess I can start making some salt lamps to sell at the mall. Now if you press U, this is going to give you get you to some important menus here. So you can press left and right to get between. Uh, the far left shows you your citizens that you can kind of scroll through. You can press V to get some stuff about this unit, press, you know, V and then enter, you get its thoughts and preferences. Uh, if you press Z, It'll go straight and put that put your cursor onto that unit, which can be very useful if you're trying to find something or look up very specific things on that unit. What you can also do from this screen is see all the pets and livestock you have on the map. You can see where what isn't part of your fortress is on the map, say those spongemen or those river otters. 
press Z to go and see where those are. Like I can see it, these giant fireflies are over here on the edge of the map. And another important menu is the Z menu, which is going to give you kind of the stats and the different types of dwarves that you have. This is all the meat and drink that I started with. The reason it's question mark is because it's not precise. If you want more precise numbers, you need a record keeper. So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is decide where you're going to want to build your fort. Now, if you've got some kind of hills like this, you can press D for designations, D for dig. And then basically the way you set designations in this game is you press enter once, go to basically another corner of a rectangle and press enter again. You know, you could do all different kinds of stuff with this, you know. But basically, this is how you set things to dig. If I set, the, if I designate this, doors are gonna, the mining doors are gonna come over and they're gonna dig this out. They're not gonna be able to reach this, so they're not gonna dig this out. To remove a designation, say you made a mistake, you just press X. And then you, in the same way that you set a designation, you can remove the designation. Now I'll demonstrate this really quickly even though I'm not gonna build a fort right here, because this is a way to start building your fort if you have elevation on your map of any sort. You'll see that this is flashing right here. That means that there's a dwarf heading over to do it. Now they're coming and digging out this fire clay. Now some of you might have started on a flat map, and that's why I'm going to show you something a little bit different. For one thing, you could dig stairs just directly downwards, and then directly beneath them, you can dig upstairs or up downstairs, which you can think of as kind of like a spiral staircase, so it goes both up and down, and then you just keep going down Z layers from there. That's one option you have. Keep in mind that trade wagons cannot move downstairs. So I'm going to show you how you can get a trade wagon to enter your fort, at least through your front entrance. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to dig a channel. Now to do this, you press D and then H. When you unpause, your minor dwarves are going to start digging out basically like a pit as you can see. These little triangles basically mean ramps. That's what allows a dwarf to comfortably climb up and down in and out of this little hole right here. Without these ramps, they're not gonna want to do it because it's gonna be uncomfortable. Though against something unsmooth and rough, they definitely could if say they were starving or something. And now if you wanted to from here, you could dig into this wall. I'm going to dig it a little bit deeper because I don't want to start digging out my fort until I hit stone. And to do that, I'm going to dig basically a little ramp leading downward. And I will show you how that's done. So I dig this out and then I go down another Z level and start channeling again. This time I'm going to dig out everything like this, but I'm going to leave this ramp here. And that way they'll still be able to climb up and down between this. Still haven't sit, hit stone, silty clay loam. I'm gonna keep going. Got a little message where it looks like there's a site that's excited about me settling here. I guess maybe the sponge man told me cause I don't see how I would have known that. Still more soil, sandy loam. Usually you're not gonna run into more than four soil layers. Even, and usually you're not even gonna run into that many because there would probably be an aquifer here if I didn't have aquifers turned off. That's why there's so much soil. All right, so now they've managed to hit some rock, some of this rock salt that I was talking about before. And you'll see right here that they've found magnetite. This is an iron ore, that's very good. And you'll see as I go up in Z layers that there's a nice little ramp going down into this pit. It is three wide, which is going to be wide enough to allow a wagon to enter and exit. And that's what you need if you want to have the trade wagons come down into your fort. So you want to remove ramps, you press D and then Z and you can designate ramps to be removed. But be careful that you do not, des that you do not remove the ramps that allow dwarves to get in and out of this comfortably. It's also, without this, a wagon's not gonna be able to come down here either. And now you can start designing your fort layout. You have all of this room to work with and you can even go up, you can build up and down stairs and make your fort vertical, which is actually a fairly good idea to do for efficiency reasons. Now keep in mind, it's nice to have at least a little bit of a long entrance because it's easier to defend and gate off in case of an emergency. Having different branches on your entrances can be a good idea too. And that way say you could fill up this hallway with traps and then Trade Wagon would be able to come up into here to where you can build a depot. I'm just gonna have them dig out this for now, along with a the beginning of a central staircase that I'm going to use to basically have go up and down between Z levels. Now keep in mind that if you are, say, 
carving out a long staircase, you can actually designate vertically. So you see, I basically designated a rectangular cube of staircases going straight down. It's gonna be extremely handy if say you're just designating the same pattern going up and down, you could just you know designate rooms throughout a bunch of Z levels on every single level and dig them out one at a time. But I'm gonna start with this to keep my miners busy. And before I start having them mine this out, I'm gonna get my woodcutters busy. You gotta be a little careful where you cut down your trees because trees can fall on things and hurt them. Uh, this in fact might be a little, even a little bit negligent, but I want them to at least a little bit around my fort entrance so that my carpenters and whatnot don't have to move too far. But I have many times lost a woodcutter to a terrible injury right at the beginning of the game from him cutting a tree on top of himself. So what I've done to designate trees for chopping is I've pressed D and then T to chop down trees and then I've set the designations at the tree trunks similar to mining. Now you don't want to do this at upper Z levels because the dwarf will climb the tree and try to cut it down at that Z level and then it will be in the tree as it's falling down and it will get hurt. Now when I unpause you'll see that this woodcutter is getting to work and now there's lots Logs stacking up on the ground that can be, ooh, that was a pretty big tree right there, that can be picked up by your dwarves to use. And if we go down into here, you'll see that the miners are starting to dig out the fort. These boulders here are stone that can be collected to use in crafts or furniture or blocks, like building blocks, like kind of like bricks, basically. And then this is ore, tetrahedrite ore, graphic dropping on the ground. So this is going to be copper with a little bit of silver in it. Silvite, a different kind of stone. And then over here, there's some sards. This is a gemstone, as well as a bit of hematite, iron ore. So I'm going to build a couple of workshops to get these dwarves busy down here. To do that, you're going to press B for build, W for workshops, and then in this case, C for a carpenter's workshop. I'm going to build it in these logs so he doesn't have to walk too far. You can kind of choose what he builds it out of. I'm actually going to have have him build it out of some rock salt just for shits. And what you're gonna see is that this carpenter is gonna run down, grab the closest piece of rock salt, haul it up, and start building the workshop. When the workshop's built, you can press Q over it. As you can see, Q basically is how you interact with buildings. You press A to add a new task, and you'll see a whole bunch of different things that you can have your carpenter build. Really cool. What I'm gonna have him start building is N for bins, A to add another task, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna press J for cages, A for another task, and I'm gonna press B for bed, A for another task. I'm gonna have him make a splint and a crutch, which I have to select manually, and then about five wheelbarrows. Now, with this bin, cage, and bed, I'm gonna want a lot of these. So on each of these, I'm using the plus and minus keys, by the way, to move between these. I'm going to press R on each of these, and now what he's going to do is he's basically going to repeat doing these tasks in order, bin, cage, bed, bin, cage, bed, bin, cage, bed. Maybe we'll finish these after he does the first three. And he's just going to do these basically until he runs out of wood or I tell him to stop. And now when I press escape, I press space to resume, you will see him grab wood, and now he's starting to build stuff. Now without stockpiles built, that stuff isn't going to get moved away from the workshop yet, but that's coming. I'm going to do the same thing with my mason, stone crafter, and mechanic that I brought. I'm gonna press B, W, and M for a mason's workshop. This one I'm actually going to build down here temporarily. I'm gonna press R to build a crafts dwarf's workshop, which I'm also going to build down here, and T for a mechanic's workshop, which is also going to go down here. These are just temporary. I'm going to deconstruct them and move them once I have more of my fortress dug out. I just want to get them starting to work where the stone is so that they can at least get some stuff going more efficiently. So now these workshops are built, and now if I press Q, basically you'll see that Q interacts with the closest workshop. At the Crafts Dwarfs workshop, I'm going to press A to add a new task, and then Rock Crafts. And then I'm going to put that on repeat. Now if you press D, you can pick the kind of stone that these are going to be made out of. I'm going to have them be made out of rock salt because I have lots of it and there's nothing else I really want to do with rock salt. Now when it comes to the mason, there's a few things that you're going to want to be building at the beginning. Uh, these things are thrones, which are basically chairs, tables, which are tables, coffers, which are like little chests for your dwarves to keep things in. Same with cabinets. You're, you're probably going to want coffers and cabinets. Uh, to put into your dwarves bedrooms when you start building them and doors are a good are something that i prefer to make out of stone because it's dwarfy but for now i'm going to have to make some blocks that i'm going to be using for constructing buildings toward the beginning of the game 
and I'm going to have him build them out of that petrified wood that I brought. I'm just put that on repeat and he's gonna do that till he runs out of petrified wood. As for the mechanic, I'm gonna have him make mechanisms which are useful in traps and gates, which are really important for you. And I'm gonna have him build those out of granite for now. And then when I press escape, all of these dwarves are going to start getting busy. You'll see the stone crafter bringing up some rock salt and he's going to start building some rock crap. You see, here's the mason bringing that petrified wood over to the mason shop, and he's going to start building blocks there. So now if you look here, there, see this little purple thing? Uh, this is bush tit remains. So this is like a little dead bird. And over here, uh, more bush tit remains. So these are things that probably the cats killed. Something to keep in mind, is that if your cats are killing things inside your fortress, which eventually they will be when you have food stockpiles in here that attract rats, uh, if you leave that in your fort, it's going to start rotting and it's going to create miasma, which is going to really piss off your dwarves. So to avoid that, you're going to want to build a refuse stockpile outside in the open air. And to do that, you press P for stockpiles, R for refuse, and then you can just press enter and kind of like setting a designation, you're gonna want a nice big refuse stockpile somewhere outside the entrance of your fort, not too far away, because then your doors are gonna have to walk pretty far to carry the little rat corpses and whatnot. Really important to get a refuse stockpile up. You see some giant dingoes run around up here. It might be a problem for my cats, but it shouldn't be a problem for my dwarves. You see, because they don't have any beds made up yet, they just kind of sleep wherever. So when you're designating to start getting your fort dug out, you don't want to do too much. Uh, you definitely want to do one room at a time. That way you can start putting those rooms to use in the way that you want them to be used. And your miners don't spend forever digging out really big, you know, multi-level fort designations. And now with this dug out, I'm going to temporarily suspend by pressing S these jobs that I have my mason doing. And I'm going to have him build some stuff. Uh, the first thing I'm going to have him build is a trade depot. It is very important that you build one of these before you reach autumn in your first year. Because that's when the first trade caravan is going to come. And if you don't have a depot, they're going to miss you. But the strategy I'm showing you, which I think is very beginner friendly, you are going to largely be depending on trade. So you can see he's moving rocks out of the way to build this depot. You need This is what you need building designer for, by the way, is to do things like this. So once you have your depot made, uh, just press capital D and you're going to see this green line which goes out from your depot and this shows that a wagon can pass. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that there is a green line going all the way to the edge of the map. As long as there is green on the edge of the map, like this, that means that the wagon can access your fortress. All these red squares are trees. Uh, this is the stream down here. So if I want, if a wagon was going to like cross the stream, I'd have to build a bridge over it. And I'm gonna do that anyway so that my dwarves can access the other side of the map. And to build a bridge, there's a couple ways you could do this. If you press B for build and then G for bridge, you can build a retracting or raising bridge. To make a raising bridge, you're going to press A, W, D, X to choose that the direction that it raises. So what this retraction and raise thing means is that if you connect a bridge to a lever with mechanisms, which is why you have your mechanic here, by telling a dwarf to pull that lever, you can raise a bridge, which you can use to seal tunnels, or you can retract a bridge. Think of it as like sliding the bridge into the ground and it's no longer there. And to do that, you can choose the direction it raises with A, W, D, X, or just have it retract with S. And if you want your bridge to be larger or longer, you're going to use the UMHK keys to set its length and width, and then use the arrow keys to choose where you're going to build it. This here will build a bridge covering this stream, and then dwarves and wagons will be able to cross it as they please. I could build it out of wood, but because I'm a dwarf, I'm going to build it out of granite blocks, because that's a dwarfier. Now, the other way to build a bridge is you press B for build and then capital C, and this is gonna bring you to like the construction type things, and you can press F for floor. This is going to take more resources than building a bridge because you're gonna need either a block or a piece of wood or a piece of stone per single tile. Supposed to bridge where you only need a block or piece of stone or wood per, I think, four. But if I was to designate this 
and it looked a little different than this. It kind of just looked like the middle tiles here, except all over. The other thing about the capital C menu in the build menu is this is how you build walls. Uh, walls are pretty important. They can help drastically reduce how defensive your fortress is. And they can make it so that you can build large above ground buildings. This is how you're going to build like castles and things. And you place those in the same way that you place a floor. And you can build ramps and stairs this way. And yeah, you could, you could literally, if you wanted to, you could just build an entire castle above ground just doing this. But since you're a dwarf, you can just as easily dig into the ground and build a fortress underground. Now I'm going to set up a pasture for these yaks. And to do that, you press I for zone. And I'm going to do it with a little bit of corn and water so they can go for drink easily. I guess there's a pond here too. I'm going to make a big zone. And then once you've made a zone by just basically it's kind of like a designation, you push enter in one corner and then enter another and it'll make the zone. I'm going to press N to set it as a pen pasture. I'm going to press capital N to set what should go here. I'm going to use the plus keys to move down to the yaks and press enter on them. And now this is basically going to act as a pasture where these yaks are going to hang out so long as the dwarves drag them there. And you'll see these miners are now dragging them into the pasture and this is where they're going to hang out now. And I'm going to start preparing gates for the fortress. To build gates, you press B for build, G for bridge. And then this time you're going to want your bridge to raise. So you're going to use AWDX to make it raise the right way. Think of it kind of like a drawbridge. Is it's going to lie flat until you have a lever attached to it, pulled, and then it's going to pull up and seal seal this entrance off. And I'm going to build several several of these around these entrances so I can kind of control when certain entrances are sealed and when some are left open. So it's now summertime and because I set to seasonal autosave, the game is saving. And I should be getting migrants in a bit, which is going to be a big help because I need haulers. Now I've got some rooms being dug out by my miners. Uh, I'm gonna have a lever room right here that's going to have a lot of the levers that control my fort. I'm going to have a dining hall right here where dwarves can, you know, some tables and chairs can comfortably eat their food. I'm going to have a dormitory down here which where dwarves can sleep with some beds before I get bedrooms going. And up here, I'm going to have a temple where dwarves can carry out their religious practices. It's really important that you get one of those up fairly early on because dwarves get pissed when they have nowhere to pray to their gods. In fact, they get very pissed. So now that my mason has built all of these bridges, I'm going to start getting him to build furniture. For now, I'm going to have him build doors, tables, and thrones on repeat. So because my woodcutter is not busy right now, I'm going to start building a dormitory. To do that, I press B for build and then B for bed. And I can place those beds that my carpenter has been making wherever I want them to. And I'm just going to put them in here a little bit spaced out. Now you can see the woodcutter here, he's starting to place the beds. And he's going to keep doing that until these are all filled up. And you can see dwarves are immediately using these beds as soon as they're made. They must have, must have been waiting for these for a long time. Alright, so some migrants have arrived. When this happens, it's going to pause your game and bring you to the edge of the map where they're coming in. It's not going to get too many, maybe four or five. Five? Six, seven. Oh, wait, well, they keep coming. There's a kid. Alright, so when it seems like they've all showed up. You're going to want to pause the game, and this is where Dwarf Therapist becomes relevant. So open up Dwarf Therapist, press connect, and what it's going to do is bring up a spreadsheet of your dwarves. Here you're going to see the dwarves' names, you're going to see what profession they show up as, and these blue boxes means that they are checked to do that labor. Say how, how the stone crafter I've been using right now, if I was to take, say, this new migrant right here, Locum, and set her to stone crafting, she'd start stone crafting. So the in-game interface for setting labors is really challenging to learn how to use. This makes things a million times easier. I use it to this very day. I've been playing this game for years and I vastly prefer this to any other alternatives. So you notice this red line right here. Uh, this is a child. Childs don't do anything but eat your food. Eventually it'll grow up and it'll show you what starting labors these dwarves have. They're not very skilled. In fact, these dwarves kind of suck. But I'm not going to complain. I did get a decent amount of them. Sometimes you only get two or three so so I think I'm just going to have this dwarf be the medical dwarf 
and but for the most part he's just going to haul so he's not going to be doing too much active work but in an emergency since he already has a couple skills he'll be doing medical stuff i'm going to have this dwarf be my butcher and tanner i'm probably going to butcher my yaks because leaving them outside they're eventually going to get killed by something anyway i might as well get some value out of them i'm going to set this dwarf to be my brewer because i'm going to want to start brewing alcohol soon I'm going to set this dwarf to be a wood burner to start burning wood into charcoal, which can jumpstart a few industries, including your metal crafting industry. I'm going to make a second stone crafter so I can make crafts as well as start making stone pots to store food. And I'm going to get a bone carver going because I'm about to butcher my yaks and I might as well turn their bones into something useful. What I'm also going to do is take the two miners here. I'm going to turn off everything but levers on them. And the reason for that is because sometimes miners will prioritize hauling and construction over mining and you generally don't want them to do that. You want them to keep on mining. This is also a good way to keep really important units that you don't want to go outside and potentially die inside the fort by only giving them hauling tasks that are done purely inside the fort. So obviously don't have them go haul wood, for example. Once you're good with your designations, you press commit and now all of the dwarves have these set as their labors in game. So right away, now that I have these haulers, I'm gonna start setting up some stockpile. Get all of my stuff that's outside, inside. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a stockpile for my crafts. Now I could just do a finished goods stockpile, but unfortunately this is going to mix all of my finished goods into the same stockpile. But what I want is a stockpile that only holds my trade goods right here. So to do that, I'm going to need to make a custom stockpile. To make a custom stockpile, after pressing P for stockpiles, you press T for custom settings. And you use the arrow keys to go up and down. And you press E to enable a category. And then there's a bunch of different ways that you can set this up. So I mean, you can have something as specific as, as only golden jewelry of finely crafted quality goes in the stockpile. What I'm going to do is turn off artifacts so that artifacts don't end up in the stockpile. Then I'm going to forbid the type category and then go down and using the enter key, I'm going to manually turn on figurines, amulets, scepters, crowns, rings, earrings, bracelets, and totems. These are what I'm mainly going to be trading because these are what my craft dwarf make and eventually my bone carver might be making totems. And now if I press C for custom stockpile and set it just kind of like a designation, this is now going to be a stockpile for my trade goods. And now you see the, these dwarves are now hauling finished goods into the stockpile. Once put a bin up, this is what I've been building bins is, yep, this guy's gonna pick them all, pick up all these finished goods, and he's going to carry them to this bin. And that's going to make them a lot easier to haul when the traders come so that there's not doors aren't having to carry all these finished goods one by one. They'll just pick up a bin and bring it to the depot for trade. Now what I'm also going to do is build a wood stockpile. I'm gonna build it right here so that wood starts being pulled into my fort. And not only will my stuff be a little more efficiently placed, but my important carpenter isn't going to have to keep going outside. So now this is placed, I'm gonna press Q to interact with it similarly to a building. And you'll notice over here that there's max wheelbarrow setting. I'm gonna press W and then set this to three. This means is remember how the carpenter made a few wheelbarrows? Those are gonna get dragged to the stockpile and then never more than three dwarves are going to be moving wood using wheelbarrows. So it's a good way to make sure that not literally all of your dwarves are moving wood, which would be obnoxious. And what it also does is say you're using wheelbarrows in a stone stockpile, it's going to make it so they can move them faster because stone is heavy. So I'm gonna start building my dining hall. They don't have much in the way of tables yet. To do that, you just press B and then T for table and then B and then C for chair. And you want a chair to be next to a table. And at this point, dwarves will use these to eat their meals and it's gonna make them a lot happier. Also to set this as a dormitory, you press Q over a bed, R to make bedroom, hold the plus key so that it fills the bedroom. I have these doors here to make this a lot easier. And then you press enter done and then press D for dormitory to switch the dormitory value to yes. And now this will be recognized as a dormitory and doors will be using this as a public sleeping space for a while until I get bedrooms going. And now to set a temple, which is extremely important, you make a zone using I, then you're going to press M for meeting area, L to assign location, A to add a location, 
T for temple, and you'll see on the right here, these are all the different deities that your dwarves might worship. And at some point, you might want to make specific temples for each of these deities. But for now, I'm just going to have it be a general temple for general worship by pressing enter on no specific deity and dwarves will now recognize this as a temple and they will also use this as a meeting area which is really nice so you can already see that dwarves are starting to come in and this is where they're going to chill for the most part until i get better meeting area this keeps them inside instead of outside you can see that dwarves are already making use of the wheelbarrows to move wood super nice and now i'm going to move my carpenter's workshop indoors and to do that i'm just going to designate a carpenter shop to be built and then i'm going to press q and then x on this one to designate it for removal and you'll see he'll take it apart that's everything that he had built up just sitting in a pile there uh, if you wanted this stored you'd have to make stockpiles for either just furniture or specifically bins beds and cages separate stockpiles so these right now these gates don't function they need to be attached to levers so i'm going to get that going I'm going to need my mechanic to make sure he's not busy here. I'm going to suspend this task and I'm going to go down to the lever room. I'm going to press B for build, capital T for traps, and then L for lever. Now this can get kind of confusing if you have a lot of levers. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to basically put them in the pattern of my gates at this level so I can remember which one goes to what gate. You can attach a lever to multiple gates so keep that in mind. If you wanted to you could have like say attach a lever so that all three of these seal. Now I'm going to do a lever per gate so I could do some micromanagement depending on what's going on. Another thing you can do is you can color code your gates but you're going to need to build mechanisms out of the same color of stone that the gates are built out of. And now when my mechanic stops eating like a lazy bastard he's going to get to building these levers. I'm also going to move my manufacturing a little bit further back into my fort by having these slated for removal. So now that the levers are built, I'm going to have to connect them to the bridges. To do that, I press Q over a lever, I press A to add a new task, B to link up to a bridge, and what this is going to do is it's going to bring up a list of bridges. To go through this list, you use the plus and minus keys, and it's going to bring you to specific bridges. When you find the one that you want to build on, you press enter, and then you're going to need two mechanisms to build into the bridge. I'm just going to keep doing that with all of my levers. As for manufacturing, I'm going to continue to make beds, I'm going to continue to make bins, and I'm going to continue to make cages. On my mason's workshop, same thing, I'm going to have to continue what he was doing before. Now they have two stone crafters, I'm going to have one of these constantly spitting out crafts. I'm gonna have the other one alternating between crafts and stone pots. And it's really important to have stone pots to store food. So along with that migrant pass, someone did bring a baby llama. Uh, this is gonna starve in here, there's nothing to eat. So I have to make sure that I pasture this if I don't want it to just die for no reason inside this cold, dark fortress. And to do that, I just set pasture information and put it in with the yak, or I could just butcher it. So I'm going to start setting this level up for food production. And to do that, I'm going to press B for build, W for workshops, and Z for a kitchen. I'm then going to press L for a still. This is going to be to make alcohol. U for a butcher's shop, where I will slaughter animals. N for a tanner shop, where I will take slaughter an animal skin and make leather out of it. And then I'm going to make some stockpiles. I'm going to make custom stockpiles for this as well. Make sure to disable whatever custom stockpile you had before. I'm going to enable food. Press B to, to disable all of this. And then press P to permit all of these drinks. So basically what I'm making here is a drink stockpile. And I'm actually going to make a couple because drinks are going to stack up. And then for the rest of my food, I'm going to go back to this menu, press A to allow all, and this time I'm just going to forbid with F the things that I don't want in this stockpile, which is drinks and seeds. And now this is going to hold all of my food. So now that I have this food stockpile, I can start gathering plants with that woodcutter who had the herbalist ability. To gather plants, you're gonna to wanna to go to the surface, go to the lowest Z level on the surface of the map, press D, press P for gather plants, press enter, go to the complete other corner of the map, go up to the highest Z level, press enter again, and now all of this stuff is designated to be gathered. And he will gather it eventually if nothing kills him. Now you may want to do this on a migrant instead of your woodcutter dwarf. No reason I can 
combine the two is because sometimes you might want to be doing this before you get migrants. Also, with your plant gatherer, similar to a miner, you're going to want to turn off tasks for him, except for food hauling, because he will likely do things like haul instead of gather plants. I think what I'm actually going to do with that baby llama is I'm going to have it be a guard baby llama. And to do that, I'm going to press B for build, V for restraint. I'm going to place it right here. Basically what's going to happen is the dwarf is going to come take one of those cave spider silk ropes and erect it right here. I don't know, it's like a pig in the rock or something, who knows. So now that this rope has been erected, I'm going to press Q on it, sign animal, baby llama. And now this baby llama has been tied up here and it's going to act as a early warning system if something tries to get into my fort, likely by getting torn to pieces. Make sure you're always keeping your miners busy, you're always going to need more stone and more space. So these have all been linked up to these bridges, and if I wanted to seal a gate, all I'd have to do is go to the lever that's connected to the gate that I want sealed, I press A, and then press capital P to pull the lever, and this will designate a dwarf to pull the lever, and they usually do this immediately. So now I'm going to butcher my wagon animals, and to do that, I'm going to press Z, press enter, on animals. I'm going to go down to the yaks and I'm going to press B on each of them to designate them to be butchered. And now when the butcher gets time he's going to drag the yaks into the butcher's workshop and cut them up. You do not have to set him to tan the hides. He'll do that automatically as long as someone has the tanning job set they're just going to do it automatically. And there he is. Boom. The yak's been butchered and people are going to take the refuse outside and if you don't want dwarves to take things like bones and horns and hooves to the refuse stockpile because those can be used to make crafts you can make a separate stockpile for each of those by using the custom stockpile setting now because i butchered those yaks i'm going to get my bone carver working here by pressing q over a craft stores workshop a to add a new task b for bone and then B for make bone crafts, and then repeat. I'm also going to press N to have him make horn crafts, because I believe the yaks have horns, and then T to make totems out of the yak skull. All right, so autumn has come. If you have not built a depot by this time, stop what you're doing and build a depot immediately, because the caravan is coming very soon, and you're going to need that depot there to be able to trade with them. And make sure, and also double check at this time if you have built your depot, that if you press capital D, that it is, there's a green W at the edge of the map. So now I'm going to build some traps. Traps are what's going to keep your fort protected from a lot of things until you can get your military online, which takes a while and is not very beginner friendly. So to build traps, you press B for build, capital T for traps, so at the beginning, there's a couple things you could do. You could build a stone fall trap. The mechanic places down the mechanisms that, and then loads it with a rock that will fall on whatever steps onto it and hopefully crush it. Or you can build a cage trap, which is what I've prepared to do, which traps whatever steps onto it in a cage, and then you can haul that cage off and store whatever's trapped inside of it to do what you will with it. So after you press B for building, capital T for trap, you press C for cage trap, and then you can start building them down. Generally where you want to build your traps is in the shortest route possible into your fortress But you also cannot build them in the way of your depot because the wagons not going to be able to go through the traps That's what this alter alternative longer path is for is that things are looking for the shortest route into my fortress Are going to run over the traps while the wagon is going to go safely into the depot and make sure your mechanics not busy or else he's not going to be start building these. So now that my plant gatherer is working and I have some stone pots, I can start brewing. To do that, you're gonna to to press Q over your still, press A to add a task, and you can brew drinks from plants or from fruit. I'm just gonna have him do both. So you notice that there's some cage trap suspensions. This is because a lot of these mechanisms have been designated to the cage traps and they're in the way. Basically, you're just going to unsuspend them here and there and your mechanic will get busy again. You'll see these dark green ones. These ones haven't been loaded yet. The light green ones have. And if something invading or wild animal steps onto them, they'll get trapped in a cage. If you're being invaded by, say, some goblins or something, an early measure against them can be to lock, say, this gate and leave this one open. And then the goblins will often just run right into the cage traps. All right, so the caravan has arrived. You can see it up here. Looks like a couple wagons and some extra stuff being pulled on the ax. So the liaison's going to talk to your leader. Press enter to get through this. 
Uh, already, you can see that you can set a dwarf as a basically a piece of nobility if you want your fort to be a barony, that is. So if you want, you can select a dwarf. So the outpost liaison comes up and asks the expedition leader who should be the baron. Uh, me! What requests do you have of our merchants? Now, this is really important. This allows you to request things in next year's caravan. Extremely important. You can go down this list here. Basically, you can press plus and minus to go between different types of things. You can press up and down, select different things from that category. And you can press left and right to show how much you're willing to spend and trade on those things. Uh, and if you have DF hack up, you can just hold shift and press right to get entire categories. If you set things to priority, most of the time they are going to bring it in the next year's caravan. Things that I like to get are leather, cloth, silk, metal bars, small cut gems, anvils, weapons, instruments, which are a pain in the ass to build, animals, gypsum plaster in case I don't have any on my map, stone, cages, thread, sand, glass, everything miscellaneous, clay, and sheets. Now a lot of this stuff I'm getting say in metal. I'm not going to trade for all of it but I want the options there. Uh, with metal stuff you can melt that down and use what you melt to craft your own stuff. And a lot of these things are raw materials, you know, like clay and raw glass and things like that, that might be kind of hard to get for you depending on where you embark. Now you could request whatever you want here. You could request food if you're feeling insecure in that category, but they're probably gonna bring some anyway. And you'll have other opportunities to trade for food, say with humans that come in the summertime. So when you're satisfied, you press escape and you're done and you kind of go over it. Oh, you see that they're coming down into the fort, going around the traps, and into the depot to set up. Now, you're going to need to set up a broker at this point. To do that, you press N to set up your no mobility. You're going to go down to broker, and wow, Baron, Expedition Leader, and Broker. This guy's just master of all trades. I'm also going to set up that Chief Medical Dwarf that I had before. So, now that you have a broker set and the trading dwarves are here, you're going to want to press Q over your depot, press G to move good to your trade depot and you're going to go down to the crafts that you have built and designate them to be brought to this depot and so with these moved make sure you press R to request the broker at the depot and once the brokers here and all of the trade has got to the depot you can press Q over it and press T to trade you can press right to get over to your items and then left to go back to designate things you press enter uh, you can do them individually with your crafts or you could just press enter on the bin to trade the entire bin. You can press shift and enter to offer absolutely everything you have for trade. And it'll show you the value you have down here as long as you have appraisal ability on your broker. And then that's basically going to be what you can bargain against. Now things I usually like to pick up are uh, aluminum and steel bars in case I have a strange mood where these will be relevant. Same goes for glass. Clay. Gypsum is nice because you don't always have access to it. There are some animals here. These would be profitable to butcher if you have a good bone carver. You will definitely make more in value back out of crafting out of the bones than they cost to buy. They did bring some alcohol, so if you didn't have your brewer working already, you could trade for some. Got weapons, uh, clothing, which you might consider. They brought bags, which is really nice when you don't have a good clothes making industry set up yet. It is good to have bags and cloth and leather, but don't trade for cat leather. Always get anvils because these can be melted down and steel is really valuable. And then they brought a bunch of food. If I wanted any food, I could grab it. Actually, speaking of which, I'm just going to pick up some plump helmet spawn, which they have brought to trade along with some other kinds of seeds. And I'm going to demonstrate farming here in a bit. Uh, they have brought books. If you're starting to build up a library, you might consider trading for books, though they can be pretty expensive. Here's the trader profit. Generally what I try to go for is like a uh, two to three to your value, which this is close enough. And I press T for trade and is going to offer the trade and he might reject it. He did not. And he actually seems very happy with it. So I could have gotten away with a lot more if I want. And that's what judge of intent is for, is for seeing how they respond to the trade. And now all of that stuff is mine. No longer need the trader at the depot. So so I can unrequest him and he can go back to mining. I'm gonna unsuspend these cage traps. See if my mechanic will build them now. Expanding my dining hall because my fort is growing. All right, so I've gotten migrants again. So I can read to see who showed up. It looked like a couple of stone crafters. Yep, 
and that's fine. I'm just gonna put them to work with exactly what they showed up as. And with stone detailing, you're going to want to do the similar thing you're doing with your miners. So what stone detailers can do is by pressing D and then S, they can smooth your floors and walls and make them prettier. They can also engrave patterns into them, which makes your dwarves happy. And as you can see, he's getting to work smoothing out these walls. Got lignite here, which you want to look out for when you're getting into smelting, because this is basically coal. And now, as promised, I'm going to demonstrate farming. First, make sure you have a dwarf set up to do farming. I'm just going to use this one with metal crafting skills that I'm not using. Then you're going to want to push B for build and P for farm plot. So to build a farm plot, it has to be on dirt, it can't be on stone. And if you're doing a subterranean crop like plump helmets, which I'm about to do, you're going to want it to be underground. So to make the farm plot, you just use UMHK and the arrow keys, kind of like building a bridge. You press enter, and then your farmer is basically going to come build the farm plot, so to speak. And once that's done, you can press Q on it. It'll show you what you have seeds for. There aren't that many subterranean crops. There are a lot of outdoor crops. So that's a much more complicated thing. So you see down here, if you press A, C, B, and D, these are what they can grow at different times of the year. And what I'm basically gonna have them do is do plump helmets year round by going to all A, B, C, and D and pressing enter to designate this plot for plump helmets. You can have the same plot, do different crops at different times of year. But right now I'm just doing plump helmets. Plump helmets are nice because they can be eaten and they can be brewed. What the heck is that? giant porcupine. Ugh. Llama's starving. This is why you should use like a dog for this. I don't have any dogs at the moment. I'm just gonna put them back in the pasture. Oh, and all those caged animals I brought. I'm gonna show you how to get them out of the cages. It's kind of tedious. You have to press B for build, J for cage, and that's gonna bring you up to this page. You're gonna press X and it's going to bring, show you like what's in each specific kind of cage. So you're gonna act, have to individually build the cages that have the animals in them. And there we go, dwarf's getting around to it. And then you're gonna press Q over these cages, press A, and then you're gonna unassign the animals from them. Kind of similar to having something on a chain. You can see dwarves are now coming out and pulling the animals out. And now I can butcher them. Bye bye baby llama. So I never mentioned how to start a wood furnace up and do that. You're going to press B for build, E for furnaces, and then W for wood furnace. And you're going to need to make this out of a magma safe stone. I'll just be using the petrified wood blocks as usual. You're going to need a mason to build this. So if it's not being built, it's because your mason's busy. So suspend your mason tasks and he'll get to it. Once your wood furnace is built, press Q over it, A to add a task. Then you're going to press C to make charcoal and repeat. And they're just going to make charcoal out of wood ad nauseum. And that's really good because you need as much charcoal as possible for your metal making industry. So you see as I go up and down my staircase, you see all the different kinds of stones and ores and gemstones. When you get your industries going up, you can start smelting ore, crafting metal stuff, armor, weapons, crowns, jewelry. You can start doing stuff with the rock, build a big, uh, big blue castle. That'd be kind of cool. What I'm not hitting is cavern layers, which is unusual. I guess I'm gonna have to dig around horizontally for them. There are a lot of Z levels on this map, though. It's actually kind of an unusual amount of Z levels for a, whoa, here's a cavern layer. Very watery one. I'm not seeing any nether cap or blood thorn, but it's also not just pure uh, tower cap and fungal wood, which means that this is the second cavern layer. The second cavern layer, over a hundred levels deep. I've actually, I don't think I've ever seen this before. This is pretty unusual. Does that mean that the first cavern layer is just up here somewhere? Wow. And then it's just pure water, so kind of uninteresting. I'm gonna uh, dig around this and see if I can find a more interesting cavern layer to show you. So I've actually found it. I figured out why there's so many Z levels on my map too. I've seen this before. This is an extremely vertical cavern layer right here. This, look at, look at how big this is. This is like 30 or 40 Z levels right here. So pretty interesting. If you were to get into exploring this, there's a lot of vegetation that can be gathered. Uh, you can cut these trees and use their wood. And you know, if you want like yellow and white beds and whatnot, there's lots of interesting animal, wild animals to be found in the cavern layers and other things. But yeah, they'd have to be kind of explored out to see all of, all of what this looks like, which would be a little bit challenging on in this extremely vertical cavern layer like this. Wow, this thing is just so, big. 
Uh, if you ever run into a pest problem, a good trick is to get your cats penned into your food stockpiles. Uh, also having pots either out of stone or clay will keep pests out of them. But while you've still got barrels and whatnot, uh, keep you, you can pen your cats if you dug a little too deep and got these nasty little bugs onto your food stockpiles. So I'm going to talk about burrows. Burrows are an important way to protect your dwarves in the case of an invasion. To set a burrow, you're going to want to press W for burrows, A to add a new burrow, and then enter to define the burrow. Now, how I'm going to define this burrow is basically going to be on the interior of my fort. Uh, I'm going to have it cover my entire staircase, as well as everywhere on the interior that I have stuff going on. This will make it so that dwarves can hang out in these places during a siege. I'm going to make sure that the farm is covered. And you can just name it to whatever you want. And then if, say, something nasty came up and you want all your dwarves to get inside as soon as possible, you would press M, A for alerts, press right to get over to the burrow that you said, and press enter to set the alarm. As I've done this, now all of these dwarves are starting to go inside that are outside, and they're not going to leave this burrow. And to unset the alarm, just do the same thing, and now dwarves will go in and out freely. Another interesting thing about opening up the cavern layers is now fungus is going to spread to any subterranean dirt you have. This is going to allow indoor grazing for your animals. This is just to show you kind of how the map has evolved in the first fort year. You can kind of see the little entrance to the fort there. It's not very exciting. You probably build up around it. But that area has been deforested. You can see my big piles of cages and beds and whatnot outside and the refuse stockpile. So the elven caravan has arrived. They don't bring wagons, so they don't bring anywhere near as much stuff. Basically just bring what they can bring on their pack animals. So the one thing you want to keep in mind when trading with elves is they do tend to bring some interesting animals with them. For example, a giant bush tit and a black bear, which yes, I want these. And also your dwarves can wear what they bring. Uh, this is not true for humans whose clothing and armor is too big for dwarves, but your dwarves can wear elven stuff. So if you need some clothing or some really crappy wooden armor, that's something to keep in mind. When you're trading with elves, they will get very angry and just leave if you try to offer them anything made of wood. So what you're gonna do is make sure that you're not actually just doing like say, all right, I'm gonna trade this bin because the bin is made of wood, they'll get pissed. So you have to offer them things that are inside the bins. It can be a little tedious, but at least they're not really big trades that you're making. And then when you're good, I now have a bear and a giant bush tit. So I had a sapling growing here and to make sure it doesn't grow into a tree and then block off my entrance from trade wagons. I'm building a little floor around where I'm going to stick my bear and this is going to make it harder for trees to grow and block my trade route. Eventually probably going to want a road going to the edge of the map. Now I've got an awesome guard bear. All right, so this farmer has been taken by a fey mood. You're going to get strange moods at some point pretty important to pay attention to. He's claimed a crafts dwarf's workshop. Now let's see, he doesn't have what he wants. So if he doesn't start his craft after he's done this, you're gonna wanna check and see what he wants. He wants logs, rock blocks, bones. That's what he's missing right there. He needs bones, which means I need to butcher something. Wow, there's only baby stuff that I can butcher. I don't wanna butcher my cool bear or my bush tit. Sorry, baby alpaca, but this guy is freaking out and he wants to build something. So if you don't provide everything that a dwarf needs when they're in a strange mood, eventually they're going to go insane and they're probably going to do something like run around until they starve to death or go berserk and attack other dwarves. So you really want to make sure that you supply them with everything you need. And also a lot of times you can get something really cool out of it anyway. So he has made Kogan Amid, an alpaca bone earring. All right, so he's made this alpaca bone earring that has a little engraving in granite of the dwarves establishing this fortress. It's kind of neat. So a human caravan has arrived and they tend to have some pretty good stuff. Kind of similar to what the dwarves bring, though they don't bring steel because humans don't have the technology. They tend to bring a lot of cloth. Uh, don't don't trade for their armor and clothing if you're planning on wearing it. 
Uh, you can melt down their armor just like any other armor if you're looking for the raw materials. So many migrants. Don't they know this place is a shithole? Like where you gotta sleep? So there's a lot to learn in this game and a tutorial like this could go on for hours. But I think with what I've taught you so far in this video, you should be established enough to at least start comfortably playing the game. If I've missed something important and you're stuck, I genuinely apologize. Some things you might want to start thinking about now are a smithing industry, a textiles industry, setting up bedrooms for your dwarves, perhaps setting up a library or a tavern and inn, setting up a military, or getting your nobility sorted out. Now I haven't demonstrated too much of what can go wrong. I'd rather that that was a surprise for you. We shouldn't be too worried about that because things not going as you planned can be a huge source of fun in this game. I might make some juicier Dwarf Fortress videos in the future. This one might be a little bit dry, but it's geared towards helping new players and not so much as entertaining them. I wish you luck on your adventures and be sure to dig deep.